You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. Starfleet is a promise. I give my life for you, you give your life for me. And nobody gets left behind. I can't, I can't. Seven signals appear across the galaxy. Discovery was determining the source and intent of those signals. Spock needs our help. He had a vision. They called it the Red Angel. I've seen this angel too. And I had this unmistakable feeling. As if everything was going to be all right. I would like to believe in something like that. Something out there. That intervened before I was lost. You like being back in the saddle? It's an invigorating ride. If there's anybody down there, I'm not leaving them to die. We could be walking into a trap. Something about this isn't adding up. Be careful, Captain. Are you ready to execute this deeply insane plan of yours? This might hurt a bit. You are my family. We found ourselves among the stars. Found our strength. This feels bad. Discovery could be doing something impossible. impossible. Hold tight. As a child, I had the same vision again and again. its meaning and where it must lead. Everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rant. My name is Carlos Perone, and today we're going to be highlighting some of all of the news and videos and trailers and all the hoopla surrounding New York Comic Con 2018. We're going to hit some of the biggest announcements and toy-related news and trailers and all that kind of stuff. And again, not necessarily just having to do with premiering at New York Comic Con, but around that time, because a lot of news usually comes on having to do with all the genre, you know, geeky, nerdy stuff, you know, during this October month. And then we're going to look at a classic Kenner Star Wars toy called the Imperial Troop Transport. This is a particular vehicle that was not very popular back when it first came out but for some reason I all of a sudden got into it and we are going to examine it in the same way that we did the land speeder a while back we'll look at the original with its particular technical and playability features and a modern one that was released not too long ago and how we went from one all the way to the other and how they differ which is better which is worse how does it fit in the canon of, you know, the Star Wars saga, and that kind of stuff. So let's get started with New York Comic Con. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin direct via satellite from our on-the-spot task force. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Thank you, Bob. 
It's Mort. With it. Mort, yes. Here I am Ted Baxter, right and here is the news. to do a kind of a roundup a news episode, particularly having to do with New York Comic Con, which just took place a few days ago. And New York Comic Con, as, as you probably might know from you know some of my previous shows, is one of the biggest Comic Cons out there. Uh, not as big, obviously, as San Diego, but it is getting darn close to those kind of numbers and that kind of craziness. I've been to a number of New York Comic Cons number of years ago, probably somewhere between 2010 and 2015, maybe, somewhere around that time frame, I, I would say. I had lots of fun in them. The main reason why I started going to them is because of Star Wars Celebration. When I first started going to celebrations here in Florida, out of all places, I, you know, we, I remember we came back, all of us came back to New Jersey at that time, and we were all kind of like down and sad you know celebration was over and you know now we have to wait for the next one and the next one will be so many years from now or a year from now or however long from now it was at that point so we started looking around for you know other conventions going on to kind of you know give us a, a sort of a a quick fix of you know the convention experience and that's how we started attending new york comic-con a friend of ours you know used to attend plenty of times so we uh we joined him and started going pretty regularly. And that show was, uh, it was a big show back then, but it was always in the shadow of San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, little by little, every year as we started to go, I mean, a couple of years, we actually went as not vendors, but podcasters. They used to have what they used to call Podcast Alley, and I think they kind of stopped doing that after a while, which was a section reserved for podcasters where you could pretty much free, I believe it was free, get a table out, out in the back. You know, they kind of put you all the way in the back, but people would come and, you know, come to your table, talk to you, that sort of thing. So we did that, I think, maybe once or twice. I'm not entirely sure. But then... As the show grew and grew and grew, they basically discontinued that pretty fast because I guess they needed, they knew they could get money, <laughs> real money for those tables instead of just giving them away for free for, for the, the the podcasting press, if you will. So later on, you know, we started going as uh, just as visitors, as uh, attendees, if you will, and you know, we had a good time. I granted, it was never celebration quality. You know, the best way to describe it was like. The difference between, let's say, going to Disney and going to Great Adventure or going to Action Park, I don't even know if Action Park exists anymore, but Great Adventure is a better example, you know, if you're from up, up north. I, I guess here you can even maybe even compare it to Universal in terms of there's a definite difference in the quality and the focus and even the people that go. Obviously, Star Wars, and this is a time where Star Wars... <laughs> Not to open up that can of worms, but it was a little more of a polite atmosphere and a family atmosphere and a very unified, open place. So compared to another kind of park, like I said before, if you're from up north, like a great adventure, or even if you go to Legoland or if you go, you know, Universal is high money, high quality, yes, but it just doesn't have that family feel, that tension to detail that you do it. At Disney. Well, that's kind of how New York Comic Con used to feel. It was like, it's no celebration, but at least it's something. You know, it was, it was something close to the mechanics, the setup, the way that it worked, where you had panels, you had a big dealer room, an insanely big dealer room, you know, and all kinds of things to do. So we haven't been there in a while because obviously we haven't been in New York in a while. But this year they had. A whole bunch of announcements, the usual kind of amount. Nice big representation, I would say, from Hasbro. Hasbro traditionally does some good presentations at a lot of these big ticket conventions. And, and as I mentioned many times before, you got to remember, they have to divide up all of their news and all of their announcements and all of their showing of new material between all of these events taking place during a typical year where you might have a celebration, you definitely always have a San Diego Comic-Con, a New York Comic-Con. Oh, they have the toy show also in February, the New York toy show, toy fair, not toy show, toy fair. But then you also have international toy fair. I think you have London, maybe even Germany. You know, you have all these little 
other events that, you know, they have to kind of spread it all out. They have to spread it out, you know, and balance it around, you know, all this information that they have to show people, you know, to kind of get everybody excited. And this year, it's been a, it was a pretty good year as far as the uh, presentation that I saw online, obviously. But there's also a lot of news that comes uh, around that time that is, it might not necessarily be part of New York Comic Con. In other words, there might not necessarily be a panel about it, but certain studios and filmmakers and stuff like that, they decide to announce things around the time of New York Comic Con, which I guess it's kind of, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like the kind of get in on the hoopla of Comic-Con. You know, you make an announcement, you put out a trailer or something like that. Now, I'm not entirely sure if there were actual panels for all this stuff I'm going to mention. Some of it, no. Some of it just came out on the internet around that time, before that time, and that sort of thing. But let me, uh, you know, I'm just going to go in no particular order here. What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, this is a funny movie from a couple years ago that we've watched here a, a number of times. And recently they've announced that they were going to make a television series out of it with the original director helming the uh, the show well that's one of the things they had uh, i think they had a panel and they went into a little more detail as, about you know when this is going to start some of the stars you know uh, what what the location is and all that information very different than even though it's the same director which also starred in the film originally yeah, he is going to direct and this time the whole series the whole story for the series takes place in the united states specifically in staten island so i don't know if there's some kind of joke there probably there is but it is a continuation of the story that was told in the movie so it is not a reboot or remake or anything like that it's just kind of like a, a television sequel to a movie and that's something we're kind of Kind of a little excited about it. I know my my family, especially my daughter, really loved that film. So we have that to look forward to. I always wondered what he was going to do next because, you know, he is a hot commodity now these days. The director, Taika Waititi, I think that's how you pronounce his name. It's a difficult name to pronounce, but he's hilarious. He's a hilarious actor. Watch some of his interviews if you have a chance. They're going to kind of have the same formula of, you know, they kind of live in Staten Island, but they know that all the cool vampires are hanging out in Manhattan. So there is that dynamic that is very similar to the movie of these guys who are trying to be like the coolest guys ever, but they're really not. Lots of new characters and that sort of thing. So that's one that, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about. Star Wars Resistance. Well, they finally... Right around, I think it was Sunday, which is the premiere date of Star Wars Resistance, they put out a, a, a message on the internet that you could stream the episodes, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, before the actual premiere of the show later at night on Sunday. Uh, so we did that. We sat down and we watched all three episodes. The way that they divided them were two episodes back to back as a long form episode and then a single episode afterwards. I think it was through Disney Now, uh, the app that uh, they were advertising. So you could, you know, go in there and stream them in the afternoon. The show is very different. The show is, as I mentioned before, it's an animated show, obviously, but it's not the uh, 3D animation that um, we were more familiar with, with Clone Wars and Rebels. It is more animation animation. Now, granted, there's always this, nowadays, there's confusion in terms of, let me be a little more clear. The difference now is that even though you have a what looks like to be traditionally animation, you know, design show, you know, animated, cartoony looking, it is no longer done the way it used to be in terms of drawing on cells and paper and backgrounds and combining those things and then photographing those things independently or mixing them. No, 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 no. Everything is done on computers now, basically. The difference is that the look, the specific look, not having that three-dimensional look that we had with Clone Wars and Rebels, that is what's different about this show. This show looks more like most other Disney-ish kind of shows, especially all the Marvel stuff that Disney has, you know, Spider-Man and the Avengers and that kind of thing in their cable channels. So the overall impressions of the show, and I think I kind of mentioned uh, last time, the theme of the show is basically, be, it takes place between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. It is right around the time of before The Force Awakens, so that uh, you do see some characters returning, like Poe Dameron, which he does return, obviously, in this episode. Even uh, Leia, General Leia, has a small bit part here. So it's more or less about a an individual who's kind of like a hotshot pilot who is recruited by Poe Dameron to go on these spy missions, let's say. And he has the cover of being part of a racing crew 
in this specific location in the water, in like a little city in the water kind of thing, where they do these races, these uh, spaceship fighter races. They go through these loops, they race, you know, three or four at a time, and they kind of knock each other out. It's a little reminiscent of the pod racing, if you will, a little bit, but obviously this is on flying ships above water. It is, by design, a little more kiddish, if you will, than, than the other shows. It does have that Disney feel of some of these other, like I said, marble kind of shows. But from what I've seen so far, there is enough mythology of the Star Wars world and the possibility of learning so much more about what were the events before The Force Awakens. In other words, what is the political landscape? Where is the First Order? What are they doing? And how are they doing what they're doing? How are they not discovered by anyone as opposed to when we get to the force awakens where poe is like oh my god i didn't realize there were this you know there was this organized and this big and they had so much you know that kind of thing and right off the bat by the time we're finished watching these episodes we already get a a little preview of the first order and the show actually begins with a a dog fight more or less with a first order tie fighter some kind of advanced red tie fighter which again you already know that we're in that world and, and we even do get a, a little sneak peek at Starkiller Base. The interaction is interesting, different types of characters. The first episode, obviously, is kind of like an origin story and how our main character ends up, you know, being recruited by Poe Dameron, which, by the way, the voice is uh, played by the real actor, Oscar Isaac. And there are other actors I mentioned before that are going to return for some guest voice work from the original film. So I found it entertaining. Could it get to the level of Clone Wars or even Rebels? But it's more specifically Clone Wars. Clone Wars got got very serious when you think about it. It got you know, it, it explores some pretty dark and serious topics having to do with the things that went on in the Clone Wars. I don't know if it was ever meant to be that serious or if it just evolved in that manner. But this show I have a feeling that it has the potential to get serious about stuff, but it will be purposely brought back. They don't want to get that serious because it is aimed, I think, at a younger age, a slightly younger age, a teenage, a, you know, a, a young teenagery kind of age, I think. So, so far, so good. I would almost say my expectations, my reactions are a little better than what I was expecting, but not anywhere near what I'm hoping it will be one day. That kind of Star Wars storytelling, uh, most likely in my case, obviously will come from a movie Or maybe a television show, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Aquaman. Well, we got some cool Aquaman trailers through this New York Comic Con weekend. First, they put out a poster, which was a really cool looking poster. Then they put out a full-blown trailer, and it was really good. And then they put out another full-blown trailer, which was like a five-minute extended trailer, which was like, holy crap, they were just giving you so much information. So many visuals. And yes, you do have always that danger of showing too much. You kind of know more or less all the beats of the film. You know, obviously there's going to be some surprises here or there, but they are not going to give you those on the trailer. But you kind of see all the landmarks, if you will, of where the film is going to go and and introduce the world of, you know, Aquaman, you know, the, the that entire underwater world it does look fantastical it does look comic bookish it is different because this has not really been portrayed before as far as the dc movies go so very positive my particular reaction to those two trailers they really held my attention and it's like yeah let's go see this movie I, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing where this goes todd mcfarlane had a booth apparently and he was promoting uh, some of his usual toys but an announcement was made that they are going to be returning to the movie maniacs line and also a clive barker i think line also but personally for me the movie maniacs is something that i'm really really interested in because i remember i used to collect those like crazy not all of them just the ones that i was particularly interested in and there's some still out there that i thinking back now i wish i could have gotten especially the the movie maniacs for the thing They're made, I think, two different, if I remember correctly, two different creatures. And I never got them because I remember at the time, I thought they were just so disgusting looking. (laughs) 
that I didn't want to really put him on display anywhere. But yeah, it's really interesting that he's going back to that. And then there was an interview posted on one of these websites, I think it might have been IGN. And there he's talking about how, you know, things are changing again and things have changed again. Back then, you know, when we bought the movie Maniacs, we would get them at either Toys R Us or KB Stores or Sam Goody or some of these more traditional retailers that... Nowadays, they don't, they don't even exist anymore. So they're kind of going back to the model of going straight to the individuals in order to sell these and bypassing the retailers altogether because there really isn't much retail left. There's only a few stores really that kind of deal, you know, with, with that much uh, merchandise and, you know, they're, they're just dropping dead left and right. So it would be interesting, you know, what kind of licenses can he get you know, to do some of these, uh, they, I mean, they, they went all over the place. They, they, they had so many waves, I remember. And I have, I have bins full of these toys still. It's funny, I actually pulled a whole bunch of them out because this Halloween is coming up and I wanted to do a, a decoration with classic, more or less classic movie monsters or bad guys, let's say. Ironically enough, a lot of them are McFarlane's that I own, you know, old McFarlane's from the 90s and 2000s. So I am looking forward to that. Star Trek Discovery, they put out a new trailer, a new season two trailer. And the big announcement that was made was that they are giving us the first glimpse at their actor that is going to be portraying Spock, which is a big deal, obviously, in the Trek community. And it's the type of story that could, you know, people could go either way. People, you know, I know Star Trek purists mostly will hate it because they usually do. But I'm all for it. I absolutely loved it. This first season of Star Trek Discovery that just passed, and I can't wait for the new one. The actor who plays Spock, who will be playing Spock, his name is Ethan Peck. And I'm not sure where he's from. I don't know if I've seen him anywhere before. Peck is best known for the prior roles in ABC Family's adaptation of 10 Things I Hate About You and CW's I Ship It. Never heard, never seen any of these shows, so he's a completely brand new face. For me, at least. So that's kind of cool. The trailer looks really good. Again, I mean, I'm a fan, so it it looks really, really good. Captain Pike is there. The new guy who's playing Captain Pike, who's the guy who used to be on Inhumans, and he used to be on Hell on Wheels. Uh, He's a good actor. I like him. He's a good-looking, very nice, Federation-y type of Captain-looking guy. You know, the interactions in the trailer, the special effects are just out of this world. I do not understand. I mean, I I cannot conceive how special effects can get any better than this. And I know I'm probably everybody's ever said that, you know, going through film history, but they are film quality special effects. They're so good. The show will start, I believe, next year, returns uh, January 17th on CBS All Access and whatever other methods and means everybody has access to. Can't wait for that one to start. We'll see, you know, how they do this year. They also put out another, I think, a newer trailer for Overlord, which is says J.J. Abrams produced a horror, World War II horror zombie kind of film, kind of maybe. Looks interesting. Uh, you know, the fact that J.J. Abrams is involved, you know, makes me give it a second look, see if they can pull something off. That would be interesting. And it, it, it comes really timely at this this time around because of the fact that I was I just reviewed recently, I did a whole show about the movie The Keep, which is a World War II horror film, in which you don't really see too many of those. I mean, you could kind of say Hellboy has the World War II background, but it's really not a horror film. But to, to actually go all horror in a setting like World War II, it's something that you don't see every day. So that's, that's one of the things that I'm more interested in is the fact that You know, can they pull a horror film in that kind of setting? Daredevil put out a few more trailers, highlighting uh, obviously not only the return of Daredevil. I know that they're they're also showing you um, he's going back to an older suit, the black suit. Apparently, Uh, we saw a trailer also with uh, the Kingpin. D'Onofrio is back, and he's just he basically, as far as I'm concerned, pretty much stole the show during the first season. He was so good. I mean. Some actors are just, they're just monsters, how they just absorb and create characters that are just incredible. And he was fantastic. I couldn't wait for him to return. And they also introduced Bullseye, the actor playing Bullseye, who's going to be the next, you know, big bad guy, I guess, for this season, uh, other than the return of the Kingpin. 
So that's one I'm looking forward to. I am so far behind, you would not believe how far behind I am on Marvel, Netflix Marvel. Believe it or not, I am still trying to finish Defenders. I know I still have, after that, Seasons 2 of Luke Cage, Season 2 of Jessica Jones, Season 2 of Iron Fist. I don't even know if that started. I think that started. I don't know. I'm so that's, Again, I'm so far behind. And I know we have... The Punisher season two also coming, which I really want to see that. Uh, so I am just, you know, all over the place in terms of trying to catch up on some of these shows. But I got to get my act together and finish these because there's so many good things coming. Right around this time also, right, I think right before New York Comic Con started, they put out a trailer for Dark Phoenix. Which is funny because this is a movie that a friend of mine was even telling me that they had canceled because of the merger between Disney and Fox... Buying, you know, all the Fox properties, including Marvel and all the X-Men and this and that. But no, this film is coming. I was like, are you sure it was canceled? I, I haven't heard anything about canceling. I've been seeing more articles about the progression and the fact that they were shooting it, you know, at the same time as uh, Deadpool 2, which they kind of stole the scenes. They, you know, they, they shot some scenes for Deadpool 2. But yeah, they're coming through with it. How exciting does it look? I honestly don't know. I cannot gauge it. X-Men films are hard to gauge for me. They're also hard to really get me excited about them because they kind of seem to kind of go on one note as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing that I've seen so far that is like, oh my God, this one is going to be unbelievable. No, I don't. I never really get that. And it is not in any shape or form a lack of disliking the characters. I love the actors. I love how they work it. It's just that the stories. I don't know, they just kind of don't seem to go anywhere. Maybe they're just being overshadowed by Marvel because Marvel, Avengers, and that kind of Marvel seems to suck the air out of everything because they are so interconnected and they're so different from each other, but at the same time connected, like I said, that they have a bigger world to play in. And X-Men, unfortunately, because that's the only property that they have or had, if you will, they really couldn't go anywhere in terms of being able to combine some characters and this and that. They're always the same kind of characters. But just like anything else, as long as it's got some good reviews, I'll go see it. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing an X-Men story. And then what happens next, who the hell knows? Now that Disney has X-Men under their belt, who knows what they will do? You know, what actors they'll use, whether they'll retain anybody, who the heck knows? But like I said, there is a trailer out there. Don't know what kind of reaction people are having to it. So we will see. Venom came out. Right around this time, pretty shaky reviews and, you know, critics didn't seem to be too crazy about it and the audience weren't, wasn't too crazy about it either. But it made decent money for the weekend and kind of, it took the weekend. So I guess it's it's kind of like, a, you know, like a, I would say like a Suicide Squad type of reaction is, you know, it made money, but it didn't get great reviews. So who knows? We'll see what happens next week, how far it drops on the uh, box office. Now... I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Star Wars Resistance that, you know, I would probably be looking forward to more in terms of the, my particular taste of what kind of Star Wars really uh, hits me better, uh, having to do with films and, and television, for example, even though we haven't had any real television worth <laughs> looking at uh, when Star Wars is concerned. But here we go. Over the last week or so, some behind the scenes, not official behind the scenes, but somebody kind of shooting with an iPhone, I guess, from far away at the setting, an outdoor set for this new Star Wars television show that they're developing, the one that uh, John Favreau is in charge of, popped up on the internet. And over the weekend also, they posted a picture of a character with a background walking through this town. The background looks very Tatooine-ish or Jakku-ish, you know, those kind of dirty, old, weather-beaten town. The character is obviously the name of the show. The show is going to be called The Mandalorian. And what they wrote up is, it says, after the stories of Jango and Boba Fett, another warrior emerges in the Star Wars universe. The Mandalorian is set after the fall of the Empire and before the emergence of the First Order. We follow the trails of a lone gunfighter in the outer reaches of the galaxy far from the authority of the New Republic. And the character we see walking through this, I don't want to call it deserty town, but very Western-inspired town, is somebody in full-blown Mandalorian outfit. It is a very 
I would say just like this location, a very weather beaten kind of outfit, the colors you were used to seeing, you know, Django was kind of like silver and blue and Boba Fett is kind of blue and purple and some green and, and red accents. This guy is dark brown armor, very dark gray clothing underneath, somewhat of a reflective dark silver, if you will, helmet. It is definitely Mandalorian. Uh, the question is, what is his connection to Mandalore? Could this be an actual Mandalorian that survived, you know, the time frame, you know, of the Clone Wars? Granted, keep in mind, we are going to see a couple of more Clone War episodes, which were announced, one more season, and most likely, because we saw the, the, the trailer, there are going to be some episodes hopefully wrapping up the Mandalore the political Mandalore storyline, which means what happens to Mandalore once the Clone Wars, you know, are pretty much close to wrapping up. We also see this guy has a sidearm. Hard to tell what it looks like, but he's also carrying an upside down rifle because you could see the, the butt end of the rifle. And it, it kind of looks like the old Luke Skywalker rifle that he carries in Tatooine when he's searching for the droids. It has that little funny wooden back end to it. But who knows? I mean, we saw, if you remember the dreaded holiday special where they had the cartoon and, and Boba Fett had a, a rifle that kind of looked like that, the butt end of it, but the front, it was almost like a trident, but all, all, like a tuning fork kind of uh, tip to it. So who knows? We, we might get something like that too. Uh, you know, they can go in many different directions with this. Who the hell knows? Is he a, a guy from Mandalore or is he somebody who's just using the armor? You know, I, I'm pretty sure that... Even Boba Fett, well, granted, Jango Fett, Boba Fett, I'm pretty sure that it is canon that those two are not even Mandalorians. They're just bounty hunters that are using Mandalorian armor as part of their costume, disguise, you know, uniform, whatever you want to call it. So we will see whether we are staying with Mandalore tradition in terms of it being ethnically, accurately Mandalorians, based on what we saw on Clone Wars? Or is this just another guy, or gal, who the hell knows, who is pretending to be Mandalorian, or just like Boba Fett and his father, using the Mandalorian outfit as, you know, part of his persona, part of his character that he's, you know, portraying to, I guess, scare the people he's chasing after. Um, there has been rumors of an actor named Pedro Pascal, I think, who has been in Kingsman. I saw him in Kingsman. He was in um, Game of Thrones. You know, he's done a couple of things. Who is up for a, a role? Could be a leading role. Could be this guy right here. Granted that these pictures, obviously it could be anybody because at this point, when you have the armor on, you can put anybody under the, out the armor and take pictures. He might be the lead character for all we know. I have no idea. One quick note to add is that in the last couple of days, they've also released some quick little pictures from The Mandalorian of some of the props that are going to be used. And uh, we did see something that resembles the what's traditionally called the Ice Cream Man. Will Roy Hood, the character that's carrying that weird-looking white hexagon device uh, as everybody is escaping... Cloud City, that they made an action figure out of him. It looks like that device is going to be some kind of prop. And we also get to see a rifle that resembles a lot like the one I just mentioned from Boba Fett's holiday special. It has that, that U-shape tip, and the back of it looks a lot like the one that we saw in the picture of the Mandalorian that was released. So cool little items that it looks like to me they're trying to kind of harken back to the uh, classic days of Star Wars. So... They are starting to tease us with this. They're definitely going in the route, to me, it seems, of of Western. I know we had a little bit of it on the solo film, you know, that Western feel. So it is possible that this is in the direction they're heading. The other important thing is that they announced that some of the people that will direct include Dave Filoni. Here we go. Here's Dave Filoni's chance to step up to live action. They might not feel ready for him to hit a movie, but at least they're letting him play in a live action world. Let's see other directors, Deborah Chow from Jessica Jones, Rick Fumiyawa from Dope, 
Bryce Dallas Howard from Jurassic World. She's an actress, but she's uh, well, she's also the uh, daughter of Ron Howard. Interesting. Taika Watiti. Again, that name that I can't pronounce. Uh, we mentioned him earlier from What We Do in the Shadows. And also Thor Ragnarok. That was his last claim to fame that was hilarious. So very interesting that, you know, you got some real heavy hitters here. John Favreau is not listed as a director. Wouldn't surprise me if he eventually does direct an episode. He's definitely got the chops for directing. But he is still acting as the executive producer and writer of the series, which is, I guess, pretty much a showrunner is his, probably is his, his uh, unofficial title. So here we go. Here's the big push from Disney into the television world. Granted, again, we're going to have to wait quite a bit for this. This is going to be late 2019 in the new Disney streaming service. And also, over the weekend, I think they also announced that Kathleen Kennedy's contract has been extended to 2021. So that is interesting, too. I know there was some you know hubbub going around that she might not be around much longer after what happened with The Last Jedi and Solo, specifically Solo. But it looks like the confidence is still strong in her. And obviously, movies are not the only property that Disney is pushing hard. You know, obviously, animation, live action television shows, films theme parks, you know, that's a big, big push, you know, with this particular Star Wars property. And it looks like we're getting close to a new front, if you will, opening in this ongoing Star Wars saga that we haven't really seen before. We had the old Ewok movies, if you guys remember, uh, which really don't age very well and were pretty bad even back then, uh, as far as uh, trying out what television could offer for Star Wars. It did much better, obviously, on animation, but obviously even back then with droids and Ewoks, it kind of floundered and died back in the 80s. I think the animation from, you know, more recently, the last 10, 15 years, you know, with Clone Wars and Rebels and what's been happening, much, much better, much more successful. And, you know, I like the fact that we are starting some new things now and we're about to get a good look at them. Uh, With that said, let me just switch over a little bit now to toys, because Hasbro has always been one of my go-to subjects, you know, when it comes to Star Wars. And in the Star Wars area, specifically, obviously, the Star Wars area, I want to look at figures. Now, some of these announcements might not be necessarily new announcements, but they were there to display a lot of the stuff that had been talked about in the past, or was you know, premiered, you know, debuting here for the first time as part of these different panels that they held from Hasbro. Resistance, Star Wars Resistance is getting its own figure line. You know, wow, shocking, isn't it? Main characters, they already have planned at least six main characters, including uh, bad guys and good guys. You have a red-ish looking uh, TIE fighter pilot, a gold First Order trooper commander, and then your typical First Order trooper but in the animation style these are obviously not lifelike in terms of they're they're made to the show similar to what they did with clone wars and rebels you know they have to have that look you have kaz tora and sinara as the good guys i guess i believe they also have a couple of two-packs with poe dameron and bb8 and uh, jager and r3 b7 which is bucket which is that weird Astromech without most of its parts with wearing a helmet. Those are two packs. Uh, I guess they're going to be the first wave of two packs. They also talk about Microforce, which is again, this is there's always some kind of kitty thing that doesn't last too long. They did a, you know, they showed us some, you know, part of their slideshow. The Black Series really is their big uh, bread and butter now, the thing they're pushing the most, which really doesn't interest me much. The only thing that's been noticeable about these Black Series figures is that. They are introducing more and more figures, you know, obviously. They are introducing a Dr. Aphra and the two droids, uh, similar to what they did, I think, at San Diego Comic-Con, where they did a three-pack of three or three-quarter-inch figures for these new characters. And while I'm not necessarily interested, I know my son is. My son likes these characters. I guess he's he's probably read a few of the comics. But this is also uh, the characters I talked about during our last episode having to do with Star Wars toxic fandom these are the characters that specific people were complaining about them being just throwaway characters uh, made to appease women and that sort of thing but they're going strong they're putting out 
a six inch line and my son was like already yeah I, I, that was, I'm, I'm gonna get those i'm definitely getting those because the other ones they're a little too expensive because they were a three pack these are being sold individually so he's gonna get the, those they look really cool i mean i'm looking at them now again because i've never seen them before i've never read them i never understood what they were all about but they look interesting. Another thing that they're releasing, which some people, again, my son is excited about, is a GameStop exclusive Imperial Rocket Trooper from Rebels, which is um, kind of like an Imperial uh, Stormtrooper that has a rocket pack in the back. Interesting. Very interesting. Again, more figures, a couple of exclusives here or there that really don't interest me much. They talked about the barge that it's about to be sent out in a few more months. This is for the three and three quarter inch. This is like the 500 plus dollar thing that people had to order in advance and pay it in advance. And if they get enough, they would really build it and they are building it. Again, not necessarily my cup of tea. The vintage collection, which are the three and three quarter scale, the ones that I'm more interested in, a whole bunch of new figures coming out and really nothing that I have to go too crazy about except for the one that I've been waiting for, and I maybe I think I might have mentioned before, Clad 2. Clad 2 is finally coming in a carded format. This is a modern Clad 2. We've had modern Clad 2s before. They were part of Hasbro's line a while back, and they usually came, I believe, in sets of bigger packs. So it would be one out of five figures that would come in a box. He would be one of them. Well, this is the first time that we're getting Clad 2. In the vintage line, meaning the package is going to look like the old Kenner package, but the figure is a completely new sculpted figure, you know, with multi points of articulation and that sort of thing. But it doesn't really matter to me because I'm not going to open it unless I end up finding a, a loose one. That's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to buy, here we go, typical Star Wars nerd, a carded one, and then I'm going to have to buy a loose one because I, I, I'm going to want two versions of Clat 2 because that's my particularly insane focus collecting. They also made an announcement that they're going to put out a three and three quarter inch version of Luke from The Last Jedi, the the holographic, you know, force projection of Luke, which you could also say that's also Luke from when he was younger. You could kind of say that too, you know, that he, he it is what he looked like. So in a way, he is not just force projection Luke. He is Luke from before, before he turned into a grouchy old man. So that's an interesting one. So as usual, I am not very overwhelmed by the amount of cool stuff I'm going to have to get. It looks like I'm only going to be chasing down one thing <laughs> for me, my clat two. And for Kyle, I'll be probably looking for those Dr. Afra figures. So overall, you know, nice little presentation. As I mentioned earlier, because of they have all these different shows, you know, we will probably uh, now wait till the next uh, big event. This is probably one of the last events I imagine of the year. The next big announcements will probably come around uh, toy Fair time. I know New York Toy Fair, I think it's in February, like I mentioned earlier, but I believe some of the international ones come a little before that, so sometimes you get a little tiny sneak peek at what comes next. I can guarantee there's going to be the Mandalorian-related action figures. As a matter of fact, they're probably making them as we speak. Remember, they usually need about a year or two when it comes to creating this stuff. Before you see it in the store, it could take almost a year to two years in the development process of them saying this is what we're doing, and then some pictures come out, and then obviously at this stage, all they have is pre-production art. I would imagine they probably are waiting a little more to get a little... You know, we are technically almost uh, about a year, a little over a year before we see this new show. So I think as soon as they start shooting, Hasbro is going to have enough material in their hands to be able to start molding these figures. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are already between just the costumes... Costumes alone, if you think about it, that picture is not necessarily an actor, so they don't have to worry about likenesses. But creatures and costumes and droids, that kind of stuff, they can start working on that way, 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 way early. For a show like this, just like Resistance, if you think about it, the first wave, what they need to start with is most likely three to six figures, maybe a couple of two-packs. Unfortunately for Resistance, one of the characters is a Klaatu looking character, but he doesn't seem to be part of this initial wave. So while I don't see myself buying many or any of those action figures, the Klaatu one might kind of make me go in that direction if they ever put him out. Hopefully they'll put him out as a single card and not part of a two pack or something like that, because then you end up having to spend more money, you know, for a character you just uh, want as a single. But yeah. Don't even wonder about it. Those Mandalorian-inspired figures are in somebody's uh, uh, computer right now being worked on.
You can collect them all. You are a toy! Batteries not included. Just get those wonderful toys. Details on specially marked packages at participating stores. Is that the $6 million man's boss? It's Oscar Goldman. Why do you have that? That's worth a lot of money. That's much more valuable than Steve Austin. Action figures each sold separately. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Some assembly required. All your favorite Star Wars heroes and villains. I have three of each. One to display, one to open, and one just in case. All right, today we're going to, once again, compare and contrast a specific Kenner versus Hasbro Star Wars vehicle from our childhood. The specific one I'm talking about is the Imperial Troop Transporter. Now, this particular vehicle is one that I've talked about in the past when I was doing individual ship vehicle playsets descriptions. But what's really interesting is the progression of how it's developed into what it is today. This is a vehicle that initially I had no interest whatsoever in. Reason being, this is a what could be considered the first EU vehicle. This is something that was uh, basically invented when the Star Wars line came out because it was not in the movie. It was not featured in the movie. This is the first time that they had created a vehicle in the hopes of maybe kids buying uh, a new spiffy looking vehicle. Now, later on with Empire Strikes Back and even Return of the Jedi, they created uh, what they called the mini rigs, which were these, again, EU-ish, expanded universe, if you will, even though there was no such thing as an expanded universe back then, created vehicles just for the, I hate to say it, but for the sake of just selling something else to get the kids to buy something else. And so a lot of people bought them. But again, these are vehicles that were never featured in the film. Star Wars being the first one, which is really unusual because uh, they only did basically one and then they stopped until The Empire Strikes Back came out. This particular vehicle, according to the history of the vehicle, was designed by Mark Boudreau. And what he explains is that they wanted a vehicle so that it could be used. They, they wanted something for the kids to be able to carry their figures in and not just have it being a carrying case like they have. You know, they did put out carrying cases, tons and tons of them. But this is a way of incorporating the vehicle design into your carrying case. And this is something that was done later on, if you really think about it, with the Rebel Troop Transporter, which was a gigantic vehicle that just carried a lot of figures. So it was a way of disguising your, your carrying case, if you will. You got dual purpose on this particular item. It was a carrying case and it was a full-blown vehicle. Well, here's what, I guess you could call it a prototype of how to do that. But in this particular case, they did not use an existing vehicle or ship. They created their own. Now, the way that the story goes is that they knew they wanted to incorporate sound features. And this particular vehicle has a really, really unusual, that I had never seen before, sound device. The vehicle gives you six lines from the film. You press six different buttons and you get six different lines, whether it's a blaster shot or a stormtrooper saying something or R2 or C3PO, whatever. It does give you these options. You press these buttons. And it has a little spring-loaded thing that when you press it, it activates a, believe it or not, a miniature plastic record slash record player. I can't really go into too much detail in terms of how it works. Nowadays, everything is computerized, miniaturized, computerized. You press a button and there's a little speaker and there's a little chip that has a pre-recorded sound. Boom, there it is. This, actually, you press the button and it triggers a motor inside. And this round white disc starts to spin. And depending on which button you press, it will actually play from a groove in the disc one of those sounds. Now, because of all of these mechanical elements inside, this is one of the hardest items to find working. There are some working ones out there. There are guides online on YouTube on how to restore them. I'm still considering giving it another shot. One of the biggest problems is the motor. The, those motors, those are physical motors. There's actual gears inside these motors. And if you don't use them regularly, they start to grind on themselves and they just stop working. Now, as I said before, this is a vehicle that was not in the film. Because it was not in the film, I always stayed away from it. I shied away from it all the time. I had no use for it because... 
first of all, I couldn't buy everything. I couldn't even afford everything that I wanted to buy. So the last thing I was going to do is buy something that was so far removed from the canon of the film. Now, with that said, the vehicle is very bulky looking. You'll, you'll see the pictures as I post them. It's kind of like a brick, like a cinder block, if you will. It does have, you know, little curves and stuff like that. But it does have three slots on either side where you can put your prisoners or your soldiers, your uh, stormtroopers. It does come with these, I think they call them immobilization hoods that you're supposed to put over your prisoners to keep them immobilized in their little slots there. Again, this is completely all made up. On the top, you have a little seat, which you really can't sit anybody on it because it's too small for, for a figure and a figure will fall right off. And a little... Uh, gun turret type of thing uh, right in the center, right around where all the buttons are. The front, you can kind of pry open the front to, to place two drivers on either side. And in the back, you also have a compartment that opens up where I guess you can put more prisoners or supplies or something like that. The whole thing sits on a couple of wheels. So it does kind of move around and that sort of thing. And and again, it is a very basic design and it's it's just not very... Pretty, if you will. It's not very Star Wars-y. However, on Empire Strikes Back, and to a certain extent, maybe at the end of Star Wars at the Rebel Hangar, but more on Empire Strikes Back, you do see a variation of this design, if you will, on Hoth, where you see the Rebel pilots being ferried over to other areas, and they're riding around on these little carts, uh, you know, a couple of them on either side, much, much smaller than the scale of what this is supposed to be. So you could kind of say, well, maybe that's what inspired them to do it. Once again, the designer talks about how they kind of constructed it around the feature of the sounds. This particular feature or this particular technology, I believe, was never used again in Star Wars because it broke down so easily. As a matter of fact, this particular vehicle was then re-released during Empire. However, they completely removed all of the electronics, all of the sound features and made them a solid little area because they kind of realized what a disaster it was to have this thing kind of break down so fast. So it was resold, I believe, under the Sears brand. I mean, it was still a Kenner product, obviously, but uh, it was a Sears exclusive when they resold it, you know, a couple of years later. The vehicle itself, I believe, originally retailed for... Fourteen ninety nine. Wow, that's an amazing price back then. You know, you had to put your own battery in there, no big deal. A big fat C battery, which again, it's one of those things that you like. Nowadays, batteries are so small, you don't have to, you know, go that big <laughs> with the size of a battery. And it, it actually did come out in 1979. Now, to help it along in its uh, integration into Star Wars mythology, if you will, the vehicle came with a little comic book. And the little comic book told a story of how these stormtroopers are able to subdue and shoot down and, I guess, kill a whole bunch of Jawas on a sand crawler as they are looking for the droids for A New Hope. So that's kind of how they try to weave it into the story. So it's, it's kind of like, oh... You see the scene where Luke finds the, you know, the Jawa sand crawler and all the dead Jawas? Well, that's because the stormtroopers had just left that area recently, you know, and they were riding around one of these troop transporters. It's like, okay, well, I guess that works. Initially in the design, uh, it looked a lot different when they first kind of mocked it together because just like anything else, they kind of kitbash from other leftover pieces and trying to put together what this thing should look like. The original picture, which I'll also try to post, tries to give it a little more of a land speedery air to it. It has this huge big engine right in the back pointing backwards. The front is a lot more aerodynamic. It's more triangular, but it still does have those six you know, slots and the two cockpits uh, spaces. And it also has that immobilization hood device used. However, in the picture here, they have it over a stormtrooper. So I guess maybe it was just some kind of tech thing that they, they could wear. But again, for the final model, for the final design, they kind of curved off the, the front. Uh, they got rid of that big engine because I guess they realized they were going to need the space there for the battery compartment and all the electronics and that sort of thing. Another story, I don't know how real it is, is that it was also might have been inspired from a, uh, this dumpster they had in the back of Kenner that had like five or six open slots on either side to be able to put stuff inside. And it was very boxy and blockish. And this was, again, one of those dumpsters, legendary dumpsters, if you will, where people would go dumpster diving and collect leftover pieces of art and that sort of thing, uh, you know, when collectors really started going crazy over uh, Kenner products. 
most likely after the fact or, or as they were closing down the line. Another feature that initially was supposed to have was a spring-loaded suspension, similar to the one they did on the land speeder, where they could kind of, kind of, where the ship kind of bounced up and down a little bit as it moved. But for the final design, they stuck with the solid wheels, uh, no suspension feature. I guess that would have added a little more price to it. Now, the vehicle, like I said, didn't show up on any movies. It did make a little bit of a cameo on some of the Marvel comics. So it kind of helped along a little bit, I guess. There was some uh, synergy, if you will, between companies, uh, you know, getting them to, hey, hey, can you please uh, work this into your comic this way? It can kind of help us with our sales and that sort of thing. So now I, I couldn't tell you how profitable it was, whether it was a great, you know, I don't really have numbers on that sort of thing. What were the, the big sales? What were the, the not so big sales? But that is about the only time we actually got to see this. And it was, a I would say, a quickly forgettable item because, again, it was not in the movie. So unless you were able to buy everything, most people didn't get this thing. And later, like I said, with Empire, they repackaged it, slightly recolored it, and redesigned to get rid of all the electronics. And again, I didn't have Sears nearby, so I never saw it. I don't even remember seeing commercials for it. But anyway, this particular ship was more or less forgettable. Let's put it that way. And as time went by, it kind of left, you know, most of our memories about it. Now, as I restarted to reconstitute my collection and, 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 and in the process also buying certain items that I never owned in the first place, I did come across the, the possibility of buying one of these. And I don't understand why, but I kind of became intrigued and fascinated by it. Not so much in the design, but the fact that this is a vehicle that never really was in the film and they put so much time and effort into it. Uh, so I was able to get one, probably through eBay, I don't remember exactly, the original ones with the with the sound device. Unfortunately, my sound device doesn't work. I have to, again, take it apart and I have to try to figure out if I can reconstruct the motor somehow. But it was kind of like, wow, this is an interesting little item and you know, I had it on display. And then all of a sudden, I think it was around 2014, you know, something like that, when Rebels, the animated follow-up to Clone Wars, started. On one of these presentations, they showed a picture of what looked like Imperial Transport. It was like, oh my God, they're actually working into it. And yes, they did. Eventually, into the show Rebels, they worked it into the story that in that particular planet, I think it was Lothal, the Imperial troops patrol the ground on these transport vehicles. Now, for the show, they redesigned it a little bit more. They gave it a little more of a different look to it, but it's still, it is that exactly same thing. And it was featured on a number of episodes. You, it's, a, it's a common vehicle that we get to see, you know, if you guys watch uh, Rebels. Furthermore, because Rebels has its own line of toys, just like every other Star Wars property, they eventually put out a version of the transport. And you know, it's amazing the design, uh, how it progressed and how it's different and how it's the same and how it's better and how it's worse. And I'll tell you right now, size-wise, it is pretty much the same size, slightly a little thinner. First of all, it has no electronics at all. There is no electronic features. You open the top and you're able to put three figures inside, kind of lined in a straight line. You no longer have those side access front panels to put pilots in. It's implied, I guess. Now, I don't know if in the show, I don't remember inside of it, if there's this much room and if room is spread out in this manner, this might have been just done for the toy. But you still have all those three compartments on either side. You still have what looks like to be a hatch in the back, but it doesn't open in the back. You still have wheel looking things, but they don't rotate. They're fake wheels. And if you turn it upside down, you notice it's completely hollow underneath. So it's a very interesting toy. I had a tough time looking for it initially. I couldn't find it in many places. And then after a while, I kind of gave up on it. I tried looking online uh, and the prices were way expensive. They were like 40, 50 bucks. And I was like, why is it so expensive? Eventually, very recently, I went to a kind of like a antique store, but it's, it was all toy related antiques. So it's a toy. It's really a vintage toy store, if you will. And one of the displays there had one on display and it was listed for $25, which happens to be the retail price of when it actually did come out, it retailed for $24.99. So overall, it's weird because it looks better. It looks more modern. It looks more playable. It has more detail as far as I'm concerned, but it lacks so many other things that the original one has that it's kind of like a, it's hard to say 
that it's a complete home run in terms of how much better it is. For its price, I guess you could kind of say, well, $24, I guess that's that's the, the, the price these days of how much an affordable mid-size vehicle would cost. It is a perfect rendition of what we see on the show. But like I said, there are certain items that just don't hold up when you compare it to the original. The original had so much built-in space. It had those front doors you could open. This one has no front doors. It had the back hatch. This one looks like it has a back hatch, but you can't open it. The only way to get in and out of this one is through the top hatch, and I'm pretty sure that's not how it works in the show. You can't just, just take this thing apart. It actually has a door, I, th I believe, on the side, where you're supposed to enter through the door, but it's a solid door. You know, It's, it's, it's molded. It's not uh, an open and close kind of door. And in the show, I guess that's the whole point. You get in and you get out through that door. So it's a very unusual result, end result, I guess, if you will. So many things are so much better and modern and accurate and screen accurate because now it's an official vehicle. It's there. It's part of the, the canon of the show now. Not only the canon of the show, but the canon of Star Wars. It's more official now. Theoretically now, any movie, if they wanted, they could design this for real. They could put it in, the, in, in one of these movies. It would have to be probably a prequel, you know, like a Solo or a Rogue One kind of movie because it is of that era, that pre-Star Wars era. But I guess the design also has to do with, you know, being able to save money. So they kind of brought it down a notch in terms of features and that sort of thing. It does have the uh, gun turret on the top with spring-loaded uh, little missiles that shoot out. That's something that a lot of these vehicles have. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of spring-loaded missiles. I don't like that too much. Uh, easy to lose, easy to hurt, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it is just a very historically... Very interesting vehicle when you think about it, how it went from complete money grab, if you will, back in 1978 to try to, you know, give it some legitimate purpose in terms of giving that you that little comic book say, well, this is what was happening off camera when you don't see it. Then they tried to kind of break it into the comic book to kind of give it a little more cred and then completely disappearing for like 30 years, <laughs> more or less. And then all of a sudden rebels using it in their show it's like wow this is great you know it looks you get to see all these different parts and you see the troopers interacting in and, and using it and and all these little features that were created by just regular uh, designers working them into the actual show and then later on with hasbro getting your own toy very based on that you know action figure scale toy three and three quarter inch so it's it's an interesting progression you know from when you started all the way to the end here which, in theory, you could, like I said, possibly one day see a movie or maybe live-action TV show, you know, toy version of this particular vehicle. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. We had lots of different kind of news, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other, from toys to collectibles to movies to television, you name it, it's all out there. A lot of really interesting stuff that I'm pretty excited about you know, returning to and trying out for the first time some of these uh, new movies like Aquaman, for example, The Return of Star Trek, Hasbro News, The Mandalorian, you know, a lot of genre material that, you know, I'm just chomping at the bits to hopefully be able to start watching and experiencing. Plus, I hope you enjoy our collectibles segment with a Imperial Troop Transport. You know, again, one of my latecomer favorite toys that I absolutely loved comparing, you know, where it came from and where it is now and the nostalgic aspect of how different these things were made back in the late 70s. So thank you for listening on behalf of everybody here and we will see you soon here at Geek Fest Rants. Bye bye, everybody. It's the Star Wars Imperial Troop Transporter that you put together. Batteries not included. Stormtrooper sold separately. What's that? It's my troop transporter. It makes five more sounds, too. Are you dead? Where are you? There's the laser cannon, stun gun, and stormtrooper. Did he say that? Oh, Dad. Star Wars Imperial Troop Transporter. Stormtrooper sold separately. New from Kenner. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. 
I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. This broadcast is part of the IC Robots Radio Network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long. <laughs> <laughs>